Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar on why your sales team may be disliking Salesforce CRM. So before proceeding ahead, please note that all the attendees will be placed on mute for the entire duration of the webinar. You can post your questions at any time in the comment session and we will take those questions at the end of this webinar. So my name is Anil. I'm sales director at Sinotech and working with Sinotech for last eight years. Let me please give a quick overview of Sinotech. Sinotech is an ISO certified company established in year 2008 with its headquarters in India and offices in North America and Middle East. We are Salesforce consulting and ISB partner company as well as Microsoft Gold partner. For the last 15 years, Sinotech has been supporting their clients technology initiative through CRM and ERP consulting, custom application development and digital transformation services. We have served customers globally in North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Middle East and Asia. So now without any further delay, let me please introduce our speaker for today's webinar. His name is Ansul Verma. Ansul is the president and head of Salesforce practice at Sinotech. He has nearly 20 years of strong experience and has worked with many top tier management consulting IT firms. At Sinotech, Ansul is responsible for the growth and development of Salesforce practice globally. He has attended Dreamforce event as a speaker multiple times and is also an author of a book on Salesforce practices. So, hi Ansul, welcome to the webinar. How was hey, it? Thanks, thanks Anil. Doing good. How are you? Doing good. Thank you. So, Ansul, we have a packed and interesting session ahead covering a lot of topics on why your sales team may be disliking Salesforce CRM and how to increase its adoption. All right, Ansul, over to you. Thanks, Anil. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining in today. Uh, let me share my screen first. Um, So Anil, can you confirm if my screen is visible? Yes, it is visible, Ansul. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. So yeah, to, so I think it's a very uh, important topic. And in fact, I think uh, one of the most important topics specifically for business leaders, uh, executives who are investing heavily in uh, uh, CRM uh, and solutions and uh, probably are not seeing as much value or ROI they're getting out of it. So in this session today, we are going to cover somewhere around those topics. Before I start, uh, a brief overview about myself. So um, as you can see in the slide, I have uh, close to 19 years of experience, uh, 16 Salesforce certifications. Uh, primarily, my strength lies in CRM consulting, roadmap definition, program management, uh, and primarily around CRM uh, in total. Uh, I've also co-authored a book called Apex Design Patterns in case uh, someone of um, in your team might have read it. Uh, and my uh, experience is uh, around a lot of technical experiences around solution architecture, technical architecture based on Salesforce uh, platform. So as I was saying, in today's session, we are trying to um, focus or trying to understand what's, what drive sales teams, what are sales motivations uh, what are the things that they look for? Um, why they may be disliking Salesforce? What are the factors that might be causing it based on different researches that are done across the industry over the years and learnings we have gained uh, during our implementations? We are sharing these insights, uh, which is basically a compilation of all that research, which may help you identify uh, what exactly might be the root cause causing these issues. Uh, then we'll dive into how we can counter these challenges, how we can circumvent these challenges with different strategies, different techniques. And at the end, we'll talk about certain next steps which can take you toward the success path. So let's get started. Um, so for any problem, uh, we need to really dig down into the core of the problem. And when we talk about salespeople disliking sales, 
uh, in my view, I think the core starts from what do they really like? What do they want? So we can understand with that correlation what they might be disliking. So when we start with sales, uh, first thing we need to understand is how sales itself as a function has transformed over the years. Uh, we have seen uh, a lot of advancement across the world with technology. And when we talk about sales, it hasn't been uh, untouched. Uh, there has been a significant change when we talk about uh, the information that's available uh, easily to the customers. Uh, back in the day, uh, the information that customer would receive of a new product or service would primarily by some sales brochures or a salesperson visiting them and providing them the information. But in today's world, all that information can be uh, researched through uh, Google or different uh, uh, web uh, or technology driven solutions. Uh, and that is what is driving a lot of that information, uh, what we call as information democracy uh, ex uh, in the world. So salespeople now have to up their game, wherein they also need to be equally aware of all that information that's being floating around in the industry and something that they should expect that the customer already knows. Uh, so that's something that, again, is a very significant change when we talk about sales as a function. Um, another significant change that we see is sell versus buy. A um, couple of decades back, for a, for a buying process or a selling process, it was primarily uh, or more or less led by the salespeople. Wherein salespeople will go in, visit the customer, shake hands, share details about the product, even provide some kind of samples or demo, and then make the sale. Selling cycle was short and it was primarily driven by a sales cycle. But now uh, things have actually turned around. Uh, in fact, more and more, the journey starts from the buyer side, wherein buyers are looking at problems, uh, challenges that they're facing in their business operations. And they start looking at what are the different options or solutions for those particular problems. And reaching out to vendor comes actually down the lane uh, after they've already started and gone down a couple of steps in the journey, uh, the buying journey itself. So that itself uh, actually adds more onus on salesperson to be really prepared for the buyer journey, buyer side of the journey, and to be able to provide right information, right response, timely response to the buyers. So you can understand there's a lot of pressure that's going on for salesperson to be able to present them in the most effective way. Um, technology in itself has changed a lot. Uh, gone are the days wherein you would actually physically go to a customer and actually talk to them or sign documents. You can now uh, have Zoom meetings with them or have meetings on Teams with them. Uh, you can have uh, documents signed through DocuSign. So technology has changed the way the sales was done uh, in past years. So this is something again we need to understand has added uh, more, you can say, work for salespeople, wherein they need to be savvy across all these technological changes. They need to be up to date about all the new updates in the industry, in the client's industry. So they are aware of the market dynamics and they have to move on top of the tide. Second, uh, when we look at what are sales motivation, motivations, what drives salespeople? So as I think it would not be a surprise, the first thing is to not just meet the targets, sales targets, it's to exceed those targets. There are a lot of benefits that are attached to that, not just growth, uh, there's money attached to that. There are many factors that are directly attached to them meeting their targets. Now, this is something that I would say is one of the most important thing that I've seen salespeople uh, going after, and rightfully so. That is the single most dynamic, single most metric that matters to the organizations, uh, primarily when we look at from a salesperson performance standpoint. Um, and the second that we have seen is customer relationships. Almost every salespeople or every salesperson will tell you that they build relationships and then they sell it not the other way around. They don't sell and then build a relationship. So for them, a relationship is not just one time activity wherein they're just going in there, shaking hands and making the sale for a larger lot for at least the, um, you can say the above average salespeople, relationships are way beyond the sale. 
They want to build a relationship for a long-term uh, proposition, a long-term goal, not just for making one sale and then moving out. Um, that often uh, doesn't work well. Now, what are the factors that we uh, have seen or researchers, uh, researchers have identified based on different researches that are going on, on what might be leading to these different uh, uh, salespeople disliking Salesforce? So the first thing that we see is data quality. Um, it might seem uh, something that is uh, 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 something that might be confusing uh, because essentially every system wants to clean up data. But essentially, it's a it's a hard fact, it's a sad fact that in the industry, when we talk about data uh, for CRM, there is um, there is so, uh, you can say a significant amount of a uh, lack of quality data out there, lack, lack of standard data out there that can be used. There are various uh, different uh, metrics uh, about uh, sales data, customer data, customer metrics. And to deal with all that inconsistency just leads to frustration for salespeople. Uh, imagine a salesperson trying to make a sale and they are looking at a data which is probably inconsistent or incorrect or even outdated. Uh, and if they base their sale out of it, their communication based on that data, they're probably never going to get that deal. So in essence, we are not just confusing them, we are actually affecting their performance with the wrong data. So data quality is one of the most significant factor that is uh, identified as a, as a, a failure point for CRM. Uh, manual work, uh, again, as we talked about, Salespeople are motivated by making the sale, by uh, by selling. So anytime they are not selling, they are not motivated by it. Anytime they are filling a form in CRM or they are spending or building a report in CRM, it's, it's not a motivating motivating factor for them. It's not something they look forward to. They look forward to meeting people. They look forward to making the sale. So anytime we are taking them away from that job, we are actually uh, impacting their sales performance, their sales outcome. Um, in fact, uh, a funny thing or uh, interesting thing, um, I was working with one of the large organizations, uh, $20 billion plus organization based out of US and uh, had a very large uh, sales team uh, spread across different regions. And as we were talking about defining sales roadmap or sales CRM uh, roadmap, we had a, a, a session, a conference where we, we brought in all the sales leaders, uh, had a couple of days of workshops and one of the interesting insights that came from that workshop was we did a quick mapping with the help of a couple of leaders and a couple of uh, folks involved. It was identified that only 30 percent, uh, in fact, less than 30 percent of the salesperson time is being uh, applied for selling activities, for direct selling activities. That means they were actually spending 70 percent of the time in non-selling activities. And you can imagine that means they have to fulfill all their targets, meet all their targets in that 30% time, which is definitely not justifiable. So definitely that was a huge area of improvement to reduce that non-selling activity, non-selling work, so they can spend more time on the sales activities and actually sell better, sell more. So in terms of manual work, we need to make sure that we are not adding a lot of burden on salespeople with a lot of forms, a lot of processes, a lot of steps to be followed. Uh, to make sure that their time is being optimally utilized. Learning curve itself, um, apart from adding too many forms, if the forms are complex, the processes are complex, more likely we are asking them to spend more time in the CRM to fill those forms and, and complete the functionality or complete the work. Uh, on the other hand, if we can simplify the functionality, if we can design the user experience or the functionality in ways, that can help us, it can help them uh, a lot. Uh, another fallacy of CRMs is wherein uh, more times than less, the CRMs are designed or strategized primarily for management, for executives. Uh, it, uh, I've seen it myself in a lot of occasions wherein you start off the CRM journey and you're talking to executives and executives are defining the CRM as they see it, which in turn would mean that it is low value for business users because most likely business users are coming at the very end of the curve 
when the solution is ready and is being deployed and they are in a shock therapy uh, introduced to the new CRM. And most likely more chances are that it, the CRM itself uh, doesn't have a lot of value for the business users. Lack of strategy is uh, again, something that I would say is, is a very significant uh, uh, aspect of failure points when we look at uh, CRM or salespeople disliking CRM. Uh, again, uh, salespeople have to deal with a lot of processes, upstream and downstream. If these processes are not strategized, is not synergized with the rest of the organizational processes, then most likely they, there are a lot of disjoints and we are just expecting salespeople to manipulate or work around those disjoints. That means again, more work to be spent from salespeople, more frustration on their behalf to be able to make things work uh, in there. And closed door, which is, uh, as anybody would relate to that, um, as we are working with salespeople, they are working with customers. They are facing certain challenges which might be impacting their uh, performance. If we keep on pushing them for using CRM and we are not listening to what they are saying, maybe they are facing certain challenges, maybe they are facing issues, uh, there is less uh, chance of them keeping on with the CRM. This gradually, uh, in fact, uh, I've seen it firsthand in a couple of organizations wherein gradually you will see the drop in there and it's it's very obvious where you see less people logging in less people uh, updating data less updates being made on on the opportunities and primary factor or one of the big factors in this case would be that probably they started off with enthusiasm but then as they started facing challenges as they started facing problems no solutions were not coming in nobody was listening to them so they went on with whatever they were doing earlier trying to make things work to make this deal, to make the sale. Um, so this is a compilation of all the different um, researches that have been done since 2001 across different research agencies, wherein they try to gauge what are, what are the success rates or failure rates for CRM. Um, and you can see the different years. And in any given year, you can see it's actually more than 30%. That's actually not surprising given so many factors that go into CRM and making it successful. In fact, in some, some researches, you can see it's as high as 70%. Again, uh, that is something that is significantly high, but you need to keep in mind that success factors of CRM does not depend or do not depend on single of or handful of factors. There are multiple factors that go in there and the synergy of those factors makes the success. Uh, in fact, uh, on the flip side of the story, uh, there is still a lot of um, uh, positives going around CRM, wherein the investment and the uh, uh, the involvement of leadership is not lo uh, lowering down, it's not going down. It's in fact supposed to increase. If you look at the uh, uh, research um, study based on this research on the right-hand side, as I've cited, in 2028, it is expected CRM market to become a $128 billion uh, market, which is, which is huge. But again, uh, it is mired by the policies that are happening over here and will be affected by that. So to get the right success, we need to have the right approach uh, for that. Another uh, important uh, metric or insight that I want to share in here would be um, when we start off CRM journey, I've seen, uh, uh, and I, it's probably a natural tendency that we start expecting results much sooner than it can be. So uh, one of the things you can see in this uh, particular uh, graphic are how different high growth organizations are using CRM. It's not just using the CRM, it's the capabilities and features being embedded within CRM, which helps their salespeople or sales management. And more often than less, we have seen that when this journey starts, primarily it's, uh, if you look at it, most likely the journey starts from top to bottom. And a lot of organizations start with CRM, start putting in their contact data, account data. Then they'll start looking at engagement platform. And gradually, a lot of organizations drop their journey or stop their journey there itself. And they start expecting a lot of value out of it, which usually is not something that works that way. Uh, you have to have commitment 
and the foresight to be able to follow through the plan, add the rest of the capabilities and have a strategy around that, not just capabilities, have the strategy around that to be able to do so. So this is an interesting graphic for me, wherein uh, it gives a good insight of where are we in the journey and setting some good expectations of what the expectation should be from a CRM standpoint, not just starting of the journey, but throughout the journey. So how do we actually increase the adoption? We understand the problems, but how do we cater to those problems or those challenges? So for, first and foremost, for any engagement for that matter, the vision and strategy is absolutely must, absolutely most important thing. Uh, because you start with wrong vision or wrong strategy, most likely you will fall in the wrong place. So more often I've seen uh, that when we start off with CRM uh, strategies, uh, less time is actually spent on vision and strategy, and uh, it's more about um, getting getting the CRM up and running, getting users access to the CRM, getting users access to the data. And more often than not, it disappoints because you don't have a clear vision, a clear strategy of where are we going, how are we, what are we going to do with that, and with, without that information, is just a knee-jerk reaction of setting up a CRM because some of the organizations succeeded with it. Another aspect uh, that uh, goes in there is uh, from a strategy standpoint, um, there have been a uh, lot of strategies that float around uh, in the market. Uh, when we talk about sales strategies themselves, there are multiple sales strategies when we talk about uh, different selling mechanisms, uh, spend selling and others. Now, when we talk about these strategies, Every, every selling strategy, every selling mechanism has its own uh, pros and cons, but it, it's not a one size fits all. It depends on the organizational culture. It depends on management style. It depends on selling uh, the organization, what is it actually selling uh, and salespeople themselves. So a lot goes into selecting those right strategies and incorporating them as part of a daily life of a salesperson. So that's again, something that is very important to have. Uh, select the right strategy daily life. Um, and another thing that I, I really emphasize or really think is, is of huge benefit, huge importance, is when we talk, talk about adoption, it should not come as an after the fact or after um, thought, after the implementation has been done. It would be much better and much more beneficial to have an adoption strategy at the onset itself where we know what will drive or what can drive strategy, how would uh, adoption, how would we measure the adoption so that we are having a constant check on the adoption and we are working with the data that is generated by the system, not by what we believe what is happening or assumptions, but actual data driven insights on where the adoption is dropping or what is driving the adoption on the other hand. Uh, Coaching, uh, one of the most important aspect of salespeople, as we talked about, uh, making sure that it's not uh, the systems are uh, usually complex and they get uh, confused when they get into a new system. It's very important to give uh, have a more structured, more methodical coaching program, a training program for salespeople, so that they are introduced to the new system, a new solution, in a much more uh, you can say conducive uh, environment. They are given the right support to be able to grasp to evolve with the new system, to use that in a more uh, effective manner. Uh, and it should not be a one-time activity. Uh, uh, more often than not, uh, than not uh, we are all humans. Uh, each one of us would have gone through the same emotion, same experience, wherein we go into a training, learn 10 things, and after six months, we probably only remember three or four of those things. It's, it's a very human tendency. Uh, for salespeople also face the same thing. We can't expect them to remember everything that has gone into training. So a retraining or refresher trainings are also equally important, wherein it can bring in not just the uh, knowledge of the features, the capabilities of the CRM itself, but it can also give them opportunities to ask questions, wherein salespeople can raise their concerns or come more prepared with the actual challenges they have faced while using the system and provide more insights. So it can actually be a dual purpose uh, session itself. Coaching in itself, uh, when I say coaching as a, as a subtopic, is 
uh, I believe it's more of um, the psyche that goes into designing the uh, functionalities or the system itself. Uh, there have been instances wherein CRMs, uh, uh, some organizations became overzealous in terms of tracking and monitoring and rather made CRM as a big brother, wherein the organizations are monitoring each and act every activity of the salesperson and everybody has to check all the dots, check all the boxes, which is sometimes not even human. Um, more than that, if organizations start focusing more on outcome and provide coaching to drive better outcome, where they can identify with the help of CRM, where the uh, the performance is getting dropped, where the processes are not being followed, and the practical reasons for why they may not be followed, uh, and provide right coaching at the right time to drive the intended outcome. That can help a lot in terms of setting the psyche of uh, CRM or Salesforce, not as a big brother, but as a tool which can help salespeople achieve their goals, achieve their targets. Um, another important factor not to be missed is the people side of the uh, equation. When we talk about a CRM, um, we, we um, specifically people coming from technology end, uh, tend to focus more on the technology and, and the benefits of technology. But there are chance, there are situations where uh, we undermine the people part of the whole equation. Uh, when we talk about people, the end users who are going to use the system day in, day out for the entire uh, duration they're working within the organization for years, it's, it's something that is that will become part of their life. They will be using that tool more than the team who has built that tool. So they need to be involved. They should be involved at the onset of the journey rather than at the end of the journey and basically be shocked by a new system. In fact, there have been a lot of studies wherein um, the, the chances of success factor of adoption becomes way high if the end users are involved at the onset of the journey, at the start of the journey. And they are uh, their feedback is taken, their feedback is incorporated, and they are with that, they are supposed to have more ownership of the system. They, they, they tend to have more emotional uh, attachment to the system rather than if they are involved at the very end of the solution, the very end of the solution journey, and they basically get a shock therapy of the CRM, more likely they are go going to be confused with that and see that as an alien system for them, something that is going to impact them in a negative way. So that, that sentiment is very important to manage uh, because it can be a make or break for the entire CRM uh, strategy. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, organizations have uh, started doing uh, in past couple of years is using uh, some, something we call as champions and ambassadors, where we identify the people within the end users or specific folks within the end users uh, uh, team itself who are People who are, uh, you can say, more conducive, more ready for change, more fast learners, and who can also interact with the rest of their teams. They are the people who can be ambassadors to the solution, to the whole change. And they can also, on the other side, provide feedback, provide the learnings that are happening on the, on the real world, on the ground level from sales team, and then percolate that information or transition that information upwards over to the management and leadership so that appropriate actions can be taken. So these champions and ambassadors can be really, very really helpful in, in the overall journey, overall adoption, and, and the, uh, generating the ROI out of the solution itself. And lastly, the feedback, um, which as we covered a little bit back in one of the problems is um, when end users uh, just get the system, but they are not supposed to basically, or they, their, their issues or their wants are not being listened enough. Uh, more likely, they will find their own workarounds and they will not use the system. Maybe they will, uh, for instance, one of the organization I was working with, they, they found that working with opportunities in Salesforce is taking more time for them than what they are comfortable with. So instead of doing that, they started modifying their data, managing the data in Excel files, and they used to pass that Excel file to somebody else to upload that into Salesforce. So they are finding a workaround to get their job done in the most efficient way they can, or they think they can do it. Um, and 
again uh, you can't you can't um, blame them for it they are do, trying to make the sale for the company they're trying to sell and uh, meet the targets for the company so the motivation is right it's just that they are being hampered by something and they're trying to basically uh, uh, come up with their own enterprising skills to circumvent that challenge given that they're not getting the right support so having a feedback loop a closed feedback loop wherein we are uh, not just listening to uh, their feedbacks, their um, issues, their challenges, but we are also regularly communicating how those feedbacks are being incorporated, how those uh, process changes or tool changes or anything for that matter uh, that can optimize the overall journey is being incorporated and is being rolled out. So that feedback is very important. Uh, in fact, just uh, on a funny side, a uh, couple of days back, I was looking at a similar graphic in there, and you can see this is exactly what goes. It's funny, but kind of a uh, real world situation wherein the design is created, if the design is created without an end user involvement, most likely end users will find a workaround to get their job done. Um, and the design uh, becomes useless, the solution becomes useless. Uh, another aspect uh, or a solution or approach um, I would recommend is uh, the process part of it. Uh, when we look at CRM or the sales processes, uh, we need to keep in mind that sales processes of CRM itself is not the only tool or not the only process in the organization. Uh, most likely there are going to be multiple uh, applications, multiple tools within the organizations, multiple teams using multiple solutions, multiple processes. So CRM is not working in silos. It's not just a standalone system. It has to possibly take data from somewhere and then feed that data somewhere. There's some upstream processes. There are some downstream processes. So these processes have to be uh, built in synergy or rather the CRM processes have to be built in synergy with the rest of the processes. The processes should be optimal. In fact, even automated as much as they can. So we are not uh, asking end users to do uh, workarounds to be able to get their job done. We are rather assisting them in, uh, for example, um, let's say if we want them to fill a customer onboarding form, wherein the information is already avail available in the customer uh, uh, space. Instead of asking them to fill all that information, we can rather source the data from where it already resides. So we're not asking them to deduplicate uh, or duplicate their work. We are basically asking them for whatever is the gap that's left out. The rest of that is automatically being taken care of. Um, another aspect uh, of process is how effectively is the CRM or the tool helping them to execute the strategy, helping the salespeople execute the strategy in the real world. It's one thing saying we are following a very flashy uh, uh, sales strategy uh, in our sales teams or sales uh, methodologies. But if in the tool itself, you're just entering it like a data entry form, it's most likely that uh, the, the strategy that we're talking about is on papers, it's not in reality. But when the system itself is driving that strategy, is guiding users into what are the next steps they're supposed to follow in guiding users on how they can uh, increase their sales, increase their cross sale, or do an upsell. That is what drives value for the end users. They can easily see that they are being guided in the journey. They don't have to remember to do those steps. System is telling them to follow those steps, or system is giving them uh, recommendations. Their their uh, opportunities to sell better, sell more, and any salesperson would like that. Um, Tooling uh, is uh, something that as we talk about the overall journey, uh, tooling is an essential part of it. When we talk about the technical solution or platform that is used for um, implementing the solution. Uh, a lot of times there have been uh, situations where an organizations choose product based on probably cost aspect of it, or, or probably even uh, sometimes there have been situations wherein a company used a CRM because they had developers who liked a CRM or who had experience in a specific CRM. Um, in the longer run, it might not be optimal for the organization as you may end up finding a suboptimal tool which may get your job done today, 
but may not be something that makes you ready for the future, makes you work in future. So that foresight of product selection of tool selection is very important to be sure that you're not just building something for today's need. You're building something, you're starting off with something that will work today and tomorrow and will help you scale your organization uh, with that uh, tool itself. Uh, another aspect of tooling in the current landscape is uh, build versus buy, as you might have heard of um, this term, wherein we call build as primarily building a whole solution from ground up. Um, uh, let's say a custom CRM for that matter, or custom application for that matter. And buy would be getting a vendor-based solution, let's say Salesforce for that matter, uh, and implementing Salesforce solution, or like Salesforce products like CPQ and others. Um, there are no one size fits all in this case, but more often you would experience, uh, and, and one of the reasons why Salesforce sells a lot is organizations have realized that when they're building certain solutions, the cost of ownership really increases a lot. And the ROI that they're going to get, the time in uh, when they're going to break even is very large, is very high. Uh, they're probably going to break even in two, three, four years down the lane. But when we they look at buy more specifically SaaS based products, the turnaround is much faster. The initial investment is not that high, so their ROI is achieved much sooner than it can be, and they can actually make it as an operational cost. In fact, for them, it's a directly operational cost linked to their sales. They can actually sell based on how much they're investing, or they can relate to that. But most importantly, their cost of ownership is comparatively lower when we, they are buying a solution. Another aspect in there is, uh, it's not just building the solution one time, it's also then improving the solution or evolving that solution based on the different business dynamics. Now, doing that in an in-house system can be very complex, but when we talk about tools like Salesforce, there are a lot of innovation that Salesforce bring in, brings in. In fact, Salesforce releases three, uh, uh, three releases, major releases every year that's every release brings in a lot of new features, a lot of new capabilities that all the customers are getting uh, kind of free of cost. They're not spending extra for it. So that, those are the things that go into build and buy. I would again say there's no one uh, uh, solution for organizations, but those are the things to keep in mind to find the right tool, uh, which will be part of, uh, you can say a long-term strategy for the uh, overall solution. Uh, when we come to this point, executive commitment, um, uh, there are a lot of uh, funny instances I can share. Uh, but one thing I, I remember um, uh, in, in, uh, in one of the big organizations, we realized that um, there was the whole initiative of, of the CRM itself, CRM overall, started off from executive leadership. And executive leadership realized that there is uh, an immediate need for overhauling the CRM and have a more strategic approach towards CRM implementation. But then eventually, after uh, the launch, after the, the whole um, shenanigans, um, there was pretty much no uh, optics, no, no presence of executive leadership in terms of CRM. Uh, CRM adoption, CRM communications. And what we saw was there was a gradual fall of adoption from there onwards. We started seeing uh, uh, users logging in less, users uh, doing less in CRM. And one of the direct uh, 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 factor that we linked with that was that as more and more, we are, or less and less we see executives getting linked to CRM, the less uh, the adoption is going, the adoption is dropping out. Uh, so we had to actually talk to executives. In fact, we had to even enforce to use the CRM data as the source of truth for any sales reporting or any sales uh, discussions. And that brought us back to the uh, adoption. So for us, as a first-hand experience, we uh, see that when whenever we involve executives, not just at the onset, but throughout the journey, and as much as executive are committed, not just in words, but also providing their time, providing their uh, their words, providing their support for any any work that's required, it helps a lot. It goes a long way in your success uh, um, path for CRM. 
So that's that's I would say uh, a very vital and often missed part of uh, the successful CRM uh, implementation, uh, specifically when it comes to salespeople who are fighting against the world to make the sale. Now, last um, but not the least, one of the most, uh, in fact, uh, intriguing points which can be make or break for the system uh, entirely is data quality. As we talked about uh, data as a challenge, uh, we understand uh, nobody would like to work with wrong data or, or outdated data. Um, there's no point working with that data, right? Because you're not getting any value out of it. So the data quality itself is very important, but on top of it, it's also important important that we are not deluging the information. We're not just uh, throwing a lot of information on salespeople. Uh, again, their time is valuable and their time that we are expecting them to read through all the data and uh, then make the sale is, is not optimal. We need to optimize it. And rather than telling them all the data, if we can draw the insights, draw the intent for them, that can help them uh, what I used to call as, as actionable insights, what they can make use of what they can actually relate to would make much more sense for salespeople rather than going through uh, 10,000 rows of Excel data to understand what's going on. If we can give them, let's say, five actions that are rele relevant for that salesperson or that customer, that gives them exactly what they're looking for, what they would be expecting, and then they move ahead. They don't have to see through all that data to understand what they have to do for a specific customer. Um, and most important, the speed of the uh, execution. You spend more time on it, most likely the sales is going to get dropped. The uh, deal has, might go to somebody else, your competitor. So the speed of execution is very important. Uh, in fact, uh, again, another example that I can cite was uh, for one of the client uh, organizations. We uh, created a dashboard for them uh, using uh, what we now call as CRM analytics uh, earlier known as Tableau CRM. Uh, we built a pipeline dashboard for the leadership wherein they can use this dashboard to look at their entire sales pipeline. Now the same thing they were getting earlier in three to four weeks and now with CRM, CRM analytics, they were getting that in a matter of clicks. That significantly reduced their time to get the insights and take actions. They were actually able to identify the accounts uh, or the big accounts uh, that they are trying to chase and who are not moving enough uh, in the sales journey. And they were able to take corrective actions to bring them into the right path. Uh, and that would be very hard to do if we are taking months and months, weeks and weeks to generate those kind of insights. So the speed of uh, execution really is very important in this space. Okay, so that covers uh, what we had in terms of problems or uh, solutions when we talk about sales not liking CRM. So that uh, that is, uh, I would say, some uh, that is the end of uh, my topics. Now we can jump on to Q and A. Yeah, thank you, Ansul. Thanks. It was indeed a very insightful and interesting webinar. So. Now we have several questions from our audience. We will pick a few of them. And uh, due to time concern, if we miss something, uh, we will definitely answer them later. So now the first question we have, and that is from James Reese. And he's saying, why we choose Salesforce over other CRM? <laughs> Uh, interesting question, James. Um, I think that should come from organization and organizational strategic path. Uh, I think uh, when we when I talk to customers on the same question, one of the things I always cite is where do they these they see themselves in uh, five years from now, and what other systems are they uh, using in in, uh, uh, in in which is which is going to be working in conjunction to their CRM, and are these systems going to integrate with the CRM? And, and those are the questions which can help identify the right CRM. I would not say Salesforce is winner all, all the times, but more often than not, Salesforce is one of the most mature CRM out in the, in the ecosystem. And one of the reasons its success is uh, it's because it focuses primarily on the sales or the CRM side of the uh, world. Uh, it has awesome marketing products, 
awesome uh, sales products, awesome customer service products. So when we look at the CRM and, and the true core of CRM, which is customer relationship management, Salesforce uh, doesn't seem to have actually a very uh, uh, strong competition out there. I mean, they, they are probably leaders with a very wide margin right now. Uh, but of course, there are, there are different organizational, um, uh, you can say, uh, uh, insights that go into making those kind of decisions. So not always that Salesforce is the winner. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Yep. And uh, now we have another question. And that is from Sruti Mamgai. She's asking what are the gamification features in Salesforce? Oh, actually, um... I would say Salesforce uh, as a CRM, they're, uh, they're comparatively less gaming gamification features in uh, CRM than uh, what I've seen in some other CRMs. Uh, it's actually quite exciting or interesting that um, Salesforce, uh, as far as I understand, haven't done as much in terms of gamification, but the partner ecosystem of Salesforce have done a lot. In fact, there are a lot of amazing applications out there in Salesforce App Exchange where organizations can basically install these applications and gamify their sales journeys and sales, sales processes. Uh, but yeah, I would say natively Salesforce uh, can improve on those areas. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Suti, hope you have got your answer. So another question we are taking and that is from Sar Khatri, he's asking, what are the dashboards, reports, and analytics capabilities of Salesforce, which can help make the salesperson's job easier? Uh, yeah, I would, uh, that's actually a very loaded question uh, <laughs> because it depends on, uh, there are multiple tools, first of all, out there in Salesforce when we talk about reporting and analytics itself. Uh, when we talk about native reporting of Salesforce uh, platform or Salesforce uh, product, uh, and more specifically, when, talk, when I talk about Sales Cloud in itself, the uh, platform reporting capabilities uh, are very helpful where users can actually create their own reports, their own dashboards. They can subscribe to those reports where uh, the system can automatically send them, let's say, uh, a weekly progress. Um, in fact, what we did for one of the organizations was we completely removed the time uh, spent by salespeople to generate their reports. Uh, we actually were able to give their opportunity report automatically to them that they can present to their sales leaders or sales managers. Um, another cool feature that I see in, in terms of uh, Salesforce is you can actually set an alert if there are specific occasions or specific uh, metrics that crosses a benchmark. Uh, let's say if the days of delay or the day uh, number of days an opportunity has been open crosses a specific threshold, it can automatically alert the salespeople so they can take corrective action rather than them forgetting about that deal and then the opportunity dies or goes to somebody else. So there are a lot of those features. When we talk about Tableau CRM, the, the, that expands the horizon a lot. Um, there are lots and lots of capabilities and uh, in Tableau CRM. And the best part of Tableau CRM, uh, actually should be called as CRM analytics now, uh, is that it is a tool built for analytics. It can deal with uh, uh, tons and tons of data, which the native Salesforce cap uh, reporting capabilities cannot. Uh, so when we talk about something like customer scorecards or uh, uh, in sales, uh, something called as white space uh, analytics, where we are looking at the customer uh, at a whole, what products they are buying from us and what products they are not buying from us. So metrics like these or, or dashboards like these these can be easily built with something like Tableau CRM or Einstein Analytics or CRM Analytics, uh, but a bit hard to recreate in native Salesforce dashboards. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I believe so. So another question we are taking from Dhruv Chando and he's asking what are Salesforce capabilities for sales enabling? Enablement. Well, actually, uh, Salesforce has uh, improved a lot in terms of sales enablement. Uh, 
I think I remember almost five to six years back, there were very few things that you could do with Salesforce in terms of sales enablement. Uh, and first of all, I would say sales enablement itself is uh, is something that is uh, uh, is a buzzword, but there is a lot of uncertainty around what it really means. And in my understanding, sales enablement is not just about uh, either training the folks or or doing some basic you can say gimmicks around sales activities. It's a, in fact, uh, its roots are more strategic, wherein you're looking at different facets of enabling uh, what I call as uh, the strategy and converting that into execution to execute that strategy that is that looks good on paper or PPTs, but actually uh, converting that into the real world in the execution, be it in terms of data, bringing in data and having synergies with different departments like the synergy, which was a very widely known uh, disconnect between sales and marketing. Uh, so sales enablement can also focus on making sure there are content synergies between marketing and sales. So both of them are sending the same message uh, and having same kind of communication. There are no communication gaps between these two teams. And training, when we talk about training aspects. Uh, so jumping to your question, sales enablement in self, Salesforce actually has a product uh, for sales enablement. Uh, it's a different SKU that uh, companies can purchase. Inherently, without that SKU, you have some capabilities that can be built. There are recommendations, actions. Uh, uh, you can also uh, uh, build uh, something called as uh, in-app guidance, wherein you can provide the in-app notifications or help text or help uh, content to the users while they're using the system itself. So there are some capabilities uh, out there, but I would say going out to Salesforce website and actually looking at their sales enablement page, which provides a lot of insights around their uh, internet capabilities or uh, Salesforce capabilities for sales enablement. All right. Just a moment, please. Yes, it is from uh, Vinod Butola. And he's asking, what are the CTI and Omni channel capabilities within Salesforce to allow calling, chat, and messaging within the CRM itself? Actually, that's a great question. Um, traditionally, when we had looked at um, or, or talked to uh, executives, CTI, which is nothing but computer telephony integration, wherein your system is interacting with the telephony platform. And instead of using a desk phone or a mobile phone, you'd actually make calls from your computer. Um, traditionally, it was used more in call centers, wherein you have call center agents uh, getting call or making calls, and they are receiving those calls from the from the tool itself. But in past couple of years, uh, a lot of adoption has happened on the sales side for CTI tools, primarily because as salespeople also make a lot of calls, talk to a lot of customers, uh, there is a lot of benefit in not just getting them away from dialing the number and making the call, but also telling them uh, there are a lot of tools which can provide the uh, insights based on conversation that's happening with the customer into what they, their sentiments might be going through or, or uh, what they might be thinking about. Are they feeling frustrated? Are they feeling happy about uh, the conversation that's going on? Also, uh, with, the, uh, with the CTI Salesforce capabilities, you can also uh, report on how many calls were make, made out to the customers. And also, uh, rather than somebody, uh, some salespeople having to actually uh, enter that manually in the system and report on what sales activities they have been performing, it can be automatically generated from the system itself, which is, again, another area where we can reduce salespeople time in non-sales activities. Perfect. Thank you. So. Uh... We have the last question since we are running out of the time, uh, but we would like to inform our audience that uh, we would be reaching out to them with the answer on their questions. Only the last question we are taking for now. And that is from Ispars Gupta. He's asking, what role does technology play in driving sales team engagement with Salesforce? Uh, when I would not even say Salesforce for that matter. Technology has a huge role to play in anybody's life today. But when we talk about salespeople, as I started with the first slide, which talks about the transformation that has happened across 
uh, sales function in over the years technology is one thing that can enable the sales people to actually circumvent all those challenges all those uh, advancements that have happened uh, just imagine your phone itself has replaced uh, a, a sales calendar a sales notebook a contact book um, the the desk phone itself that tool that small phone that you have itself has replaced almost 10 to 12 different tools that sales people used to use in the past so technology can be a big a big enabler big game changer in terms of uh, uh, sales itself in fact uh, for that matter anybody uh, any any phase of uh, sphere of the life in fact All right. Uh, thank you, Ansul. As I said, we are unfortunately running out of the time and we'll, we still have many other questions. And uh, as I said, uh, we will definitely reach out to them with the answer of all of the question. Thank you, Ansul. To everyone. Uh, well, before thank that, um, yeah, just mm -hmm. to also include, uh, as we talked about a lot of these steps, there is understandably uh, lack uh, lack of our time right now, but we also yeah. are offering free consultation uh, to our, our customers or in fact to everyone in the audience. So if your organizations are also facing same problems, if you are uh, leaders or working with the leaders uh, in your organization who are facing similar challenges, similar dilemma, we can uh, provide and offer a complimentary uh, one to one session where we can have um, interaction with the organization or your leaders, uh, understand the challenges and help you carve out at least a high level strategy or a path in terms of how you can achieve the goals, uh, adoption goals at the least to get there. Uh, so I would highly recommend everyone to uh, reconsider this um, um, opportunity and uh, anybody who's interested, who, he can uh, reach out, he or she can reach out to Clifton Michaels from our team who's the uh, director of sales for uh, Salesforce uh, 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 Technologies, Salesforce Solutions. And you can book a 15 minute session with Cliff uh, to help us understand the background of the organization for the different audience, which accordingly uh, with that, we can set up a 45 to uh, one hour, 45 minutes to one hour session uh, as a next step. So, well, that's all from my side. Thanks, Anil. Yeah, Thanks thank everyone for joining in. Thank you, Ansul. Definitely everyone should have benefit of this free consultation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ansul. Thanks for your time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much for your time to join us. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day and good weekend. Thank you.